Susie, I'm going to now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Lauren Banco, who is um, a research associate at the University of Manchester. Today, she will be talking about indigeneity and immigration, the Palestine administration, colonialism, viewed through immigration Dr. policies. Dr. Lauren Banco is going to speak um, for 25 minutes and it's open to discussion. Thanks so much to, to James and to the student organisers for having me. I really think this is you know, a, a great initiative and I'm really looking forward to the questions in the Q&A. Actually, um, and thanks to Rosie as well for being really helpful with, with answering some questions I had. I was initially told to speak for 20 minutes, so I'm probably not going to go over that at all. Um, so we'll probably have a lot of time for Q&A. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint as such, but I'm just going to kind of give more of an informal talk, I think. Um, and my presentation on indigeneity and on immigration is, I don't want to say it's more conceptual because I don't think it really is, but I want to sort of think about certain aspects of the Palestine mandate that are a little bit less discussed in the wider literature. I want to talk a little, just a little bit about historiography as well and where what I want to discuss today fits into this broader picture um, of what hasn't really been fleshed out so much in, in writings on the mandate or um, really in, in writings on Palestine in general. And I don't want to, again, I don't want to kind of draw too many examples into this today. I want to just kind of have an open-ended, almost discussion about certain topics and themes and also the terminology that we use when we talk about Palestine specifically in the context of settler colonialism and this broader term of indigeneity and what that means for this particular context. And I'll try not to do too much reading, although it is, I am kind of reading a little bit from, from a, the, the presentation here. Um, but obviously, if there are questions or if there are clarifications that are needed, you know, flag them up as soon as you might hear them or as soon as they come to mind, and then we can discuss them much more in the Q&A. I want to reflect more or less on issues in the mandate that are related to immigration policy, settler colonialism, and indigeneity. And what's ultimately an issue here, I think, both for my talk, and as I said a, a minute ago in the historiography of the mandate, is that I think still in you know 2021, many histories of this time period, the British period specifically, rely on this hegemonic nationalist framework to understand what the mandate was. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a you know, a bad thing, but I think it obscures quite a lot of what we could be trying to understand better in Palestine and in the wider Arab Middle East and North Africa. So by this hegemonic nationalist framework, which I'm sure many of you are, are aware of or have heard of or have thought about, what I mean is that histories of Palestine, in these histories of Palestine, there's social, cultural, economic, and obviously political relations in the territory are framed by nationalism or national identity as the driving force for these relations and for engagement between communities with each other and with the British led administration. And this framework assumes, this nationalist framework assumes, as I think we're all well aware of, that there were two separate spaces that were developing in the mandate period and even before that or three separate spaces if we think of work like Laura Robson and others on Christian communities and Orthodox communities. And histories from below of the mandate, um, well, there are some really brilliant ones like Ted Swedenberg, Charles Anderson, others that focus on peasants uh, or the Fellahin. Resistance and national consciousness are still almost, I mean, if not always central, they're still there, even in critical histories of, of sort of, you know, peasants or history from below. Yet there is this plethora of relations and experiences that existed in Palestine, which can be better understood by stepping away from this framework. And of course, you know, the actors, the subjects, the agents of the history of the mandate and of Zionism and of Palestinian Arab nationalism can't be removed from histories of Palestine, of course. But I want to use this time to think about how to reframe relations between individuals in the mandate, namely through the lens of settler colonialism and immigration policy. And both of these elements, of course, are political in nature. 
right? So we can, and can be discussed in terms of Zionism as an ethno-national movement, Palestinian Arab national responses to that, how we fit immigration and, and colonialism into it. But I want to think about what settler colonialism and indigeneity meant for Arabs who were not from the borders of what becomes Mandate Palestine. And for, for lack of a better word, Arabic speaking Jews or Middle Eastern Jews who are also not from this same space. And I want to begin, I mean, I've already kind of gone on a bit, but I want to, to now think about the meaning of indigeneity in the context of Palestine. And I hope we can get into this a bit more in the Q&A or maybe later on those who are involved in the historiography panel, maybe this will come up as well. But indigeneity I want to think of is not just a matter of birthplace. So not just a matter of if you're born in a certain place, your family is from that place, that this makes you indigenous, which obviously this is the case, but I think Indigeneity is often linked to tracing this sense of continuous belonging and continuous residence over a very long time period. And to be indigenous, of course, is often noted in, in kind of contradistinction to being a settler, at least in terms of residence and belonging. And I want to think instead about indigeneity as a question of how someone is conscripted into the structure of settler colonialism in the specific case of Palestine. And this is important, I think, because it's of course the British administration and British imperialism and British kind of understandings of empire, but also of residence, of belonging, of subjecthood. Um, it's the British that first create citizenship regulations and immigration regulations in Palestine. And both of these quite prominently allowed for the processes of settler colonialism to really begin to ramp up after the mid 1920s in, in Mandate Palestine. And so I propose we consider thinking about indigeneity as through connections to land, to social formations, to understandings of community, et cetera, but not necessarily to continual uninterrupted presence, which brings a number of questions at least for this particular context of immigration policy, which namely are, what does it mean then for groups that fall on the kind of indigenous side of this settler native divide, such as Arabs who are in Palestine, but they have their origins elsewhere, and who are not indigenous in quite the same way as local, for lack of a better word, local Palestinians may be, and groups who are also not settlers. Right, so it's the British development of nationality and citizenship in Palestine that ultimately ensured that Arabs who were not local to Palestine, right, they hadn't necessarily fit this traditional understanding of indigeneity, but who lived or resided in Palestine, the British ensured that they couldn't necessarily become citizens without meeting quite specific criteria. And Again, it's the British development of nationality, of citizenship, of immigration that determines which Arabs could enter Palestine and reside and work there. And this contributes to the indigenous settler divide in a very particular way as it developed in both Palestinian Arab and Zionist discourse during the 1920s, the 1930s, 1940s. And I think still to today, the way that historians understand these kind of processes of belonging in Mandate Palestine. <clears throat> so despite, you know, what I said earlier about national identity and nationalism is still framing the terms of historiography on the mandate, there is definitely this growing literature on late Ottoman and mandate Palestine, which I'm sure the student uh, participants here read in, in the class at Edge Hill, that devotes attention to groups who don't necessarily fit into this Palestinian Arab, you know, Jewish or indigenous settler dichotomy. So histories of the, the Sephardim, of Middle Eastern and Arabic speaking Jews, for instance, there's quite a lot of, of new work on that that I think takes us further away from this nationalist framework. And while Palestinian and Arab historians and sociologists have long used the framework of settler colonialism to demonstrate the development of structures of power and dispossession before 1948, so during the mandate, this framing, as I said, really obscures a variety of experiences and of histories of agencies and also of meaningful interactions by Palestine's residents with each other and with outsiders. So here I want 
to think about how expanding the category of indigenous might help to try and understand what I refer to as non-settler migration in Palestine and the way that the immigration regulations in the mandate affected this type of migration. And I'll talk about immigration regulations in a, in a second. I refer you know, to Arabs and others not born in Palestine as not necessarily indigenous, but of course, as I said, this is an imperfect term because most of the migrants under consideration were indigenous to territories you know, within what had been the Ottoman Empire. <clears throat> and my own work, which I'm not going to talk about too much today, Something that I ask is to what extent formerly Ottoman Arabs from say Syria or Iraq or Egyptian Arabs or Armenians, for instance, presented <laughs> themselves as indigenous in the context of their residency in Palestine and in the context of their right to em immigrate to Palestine. And the experience of these individuals, so Armenians or Arab or Arabic speaking Jews from Syria or Iraq or Egyptians, many of them end up being not integrated into Palestine, not given citizenship, and in, in many cases deported as well because they contravene immigration ordinances. So as I said, my own, I'm interested in how these individuals and communities are presenting themselves as indigenous to kind of contravene immigration restrictions that would have otherwise, you know, as, as set up by the British, wouldn't have allowed them into the territory. <clears throat> And of course, Jewish migrants who are from the Middle East, who are from Arab territories or from the wider Ottoman Empire, coming into Palestine inevitably become part of this settler society, even though I think their experiences of residence and crossing the borders of the mandate can be viewed in similar ways as those of Armenians or Syrian Arab migrants. So I'll just kind of... Um, let me see how much time I have. Um, I'll just go talk a little bit about immigration policy um, because I think it's also important to sort of center this discussion of how indigeneity becomes sort of legitimized in a particular way by the British into the mandate regulations. Throughout the mandate, the British administration sticks to this very kind of regimented set of immigration policies which were changed a little bit and amended slightly throughout the mandate period. But ultimately, of course, they privileged Jewish or Zionist Jewish immigration into Palestine, kind of above all other types of, of migration. <clears throat> and these immigration regulations, they, the British sort of set them out in, in Palestine in 1920, really before the mandate is fully operative and, and ratified. And of course, it's well known on the literature and the mandate that settler colonialism becomes this official policy of Great Britain during the 1920s, namely as a consequence of Britain endorsing the Jewish national homeland and then the mandate's immigration and citizenship regulations. And I think to, um, to be sure, Great Britain instituted a system of, of immigration, which at its core, I think firstly maintained a preference for European Jewish immigrants over others, including Jews um, from the Arab world and non-Jews from the Arab world or, or from elsewhere in the former Ottoman territory. And secondly, this system of immigration was shaped by who could pay to enter Palestine. And I think that's something that in histories of the mandate and even histories of, of immigration to, to Palestine, we don't necessarily think about this as a almost monetary transaction, which isn't that dissimilar to how we think about immigration, at least into Great Britain today or into other places, you know, the people who can pay to enter or who can prove they have the funds um, to back up their maintenance are the ones who are more or less given the right to, to become migrants. And the most secure path in Palestine to immigration was laid out for those Jewish migrants and I mean, we can also think about other migrants that weren't Jewish, um, but those who had independent financial means. So they had land holdings, they had money in businesses, in stock, in savings, or were members of certain professions. And obviously these are more or less middle-class or elite professions that would grant them financial independence in Palestine and give them employment in, in that particular sector. And then on the other hand, the, the immigration that we maybe hear about more often or read about more often in histories of the mandate 
is the kind of quota immigration of Jews. So quotas that are given for the number of Jewish immigrants who could receive immigration certificates to come to Palestine as workers and as immigrants. So these numbers were set by Great Britain, also by the High Commissioner in Palestine, the British High Commissioner. And it's this, you know, the British who also determined which types of migrants could enter Palestine, you know, based on the economic capacity of the territory. And it's the Zionist organization then that decides which Jewish laborers could apply for these certificates. So in which locations in, in Eastern Europe and then eventually in other places. And basically it's laborers or workers who didn't have sufficient savings or didn't have sufficient capital of their own or financial sponsorship that face limitations on entering Palestine as immigrants. <clears throat> and in reality, I think what the Zionist organization does is of course, the argument has been made that they sought to exploit loopholes in immigration regulations that were set up by Great Britain to try and get opportunities to bring more Jews to Palestine. And most of the time the Zionist organization is focusing on Jews coming to Palestine who fit the category of being capitalists with money, with savings, or dependents of people who had independent means. But in, you know, at the same time, I think the Zionist organization we should really understand is not as keen to exploit these loopholes in immigration when it might involve the opportunity to bring non-European Jews into Palestine. And there are some exceptions like Yemeni Jews, um, but for the most part, the Zionist organization is also constructing its own understanding of which Jews as immigrants are going to be portrayed as indigenous to Palestine. Both Zionist interests in a particular type of settler colonialism and then the British interpretations as to who was indigenous and for the British, this largely meant that Arabs from outside of Palestine were not indigenous and did not necessarily have the right to enter Palestine, um, including Jews from elsewhere in the region. It, it's these things that limit the type of legal routes that were available for migrants to enter and remain indefinitely in Palestine. Right? So foreign laborers, travelers could not legally settle in Palestine for more than a certain amount of time. Um, unless they enter and, and they also are able to fit specific immigration categories that give them, you know, in modern terms, kind of leave to remain and a chance to naturalize. <clears throat> and what this ends up doing, and I'll start talking to you here in a minute, is that it's temporary workers, low wage workers or low wage migrant workers who don't really qualify to remain in Palestine under particular immigration categories. And I think we, you know, obviously in, in looking at the history of the mandate, we know which kinds of European Jews or Zionists populate Palestine during particular time periods. And we, you know, sort of understand which one, which, which Zionists, which European Jews are coming under this labor schedule as immigrant workers. But I think what's obscured here is non-Jews or Arabic speaking Jews who are trying also to enter Palestine through these same routes and being blocked because of immigration policy by the British and those who do enter are faced with you know this whole host of other difficulties that wouldn't be so dissimilar to what we would call um, unauthorized migrants today in particular places and it's the stories of these you know Arabs Arabic speaking Jews that again, as I, I kind of keep emphasizing here, are a bit underrepresented in understandings of the mandate, even though they play such a big role in Britain really amping up, in a sense, immigration policy and, un and the British kind of understanding of who should be restricted from entering Palestine. Um, <clears throat> so going forward, something that I, that I argue in my work, and also I want to make the point here, is that neither nationalist narratives, so neither historical narratives in which Mandate Palestine is inhabited by Jews and Palestinians, nor settler colonial narratives, um, so narratives in which the Mandate is inhabited by settlers and then indigenous Arabs, fully account for the complexity of lives lived in Palestine, in which individuals and communities of migrants who didn't fit these two or even three kind of ethno-national communities, they still are participating in the spheres you know, of, of politics, of economics, of social life in the mandate. 
but because they're not kind of seen as Palestine sort of native residents and they're not seen as European colonists who um, came to Palestine, I think their stories are a bit under, I mean, for sure their stories are, are not really as clear, even as immigration regulations didn't allow for their ease of residence, migration, naturalization, in the same way they did for European Jews. And this settler indigenous binary is not black and white, as I think is, you know, what we can probably understand that it's a historically imposed structure, right? To be a settler or to be indigenous is not something that's an essential characteristic of Palestine's societal makeup, but it's an imposed structure. And indigenous and non-indigenous are kind of imperfect terms because most of those people who are encountering the mandates immigration regulations were in fact local to different parts of the Ottoman Empire, right? There were many of these people coming to Palestine's borders who are trying to enter as migrants are not from Europe, Central Europe, East Eastern Europe, they're not necessarily Jews or Zionists, but there's you know, a huge amount that are coming from North Africa, from Central Asia, places like Afghanistan even, um, Greece, Turkey, you know, after certain time periods. <clears throat> and they're encountering these immigration regulations that really imposed you know, indigenous settler binaries and they're unable to enter. And again, as if they are entered, they're not able to stay in Palestine, which means quite a lot when we think also about 1948 and who we see as uh, being impacted by the Nakba. <clears throat> and it's British mandate officials, and I'll conclude now that um, British mandate officials understandings of who can claim indigenous status in Palestine really is what shapes the distribution of rights to reside there. And this in part, also this distribution in, of, of rights produces this settler colonial structure into which migrants were absorbed. And I'll, I'll end um, there. So thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Banco. We'll now go on to Q&A. Um, Q Does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Well, I guess I'll, I'll ask you a question. Um, would you say that the migration of Jews is more of a capitalist movement or motive rather than a religious motive then? And do you have any like statistics to back it up? Um, I mean, for sure, I think we can say, I think one of the, the, the talks later today is probably going to go into this in a lot more detail. And I think it's not really capitalist or religious as one, you know, one or the other is the motivating factor of bringing people to Palestine. I think what ends up happening is more people in the immigration records are coming because they are, even if they're not seeing themselves as capitalists, they're allowed in because they have this amount of money rather than those that are coming in for religious reasons. I think during the mandate period, one way to enter Palestine, of course, as a legitimate migrant, if you don't have the money or the capital or you don't have a job already lined up, is to um, enroll yourself in a school, in a religious school um, and get sponsorship that way. So there are people coming into Palestine who are coming for religious reasons or they're coming to study or they're coming because they can get that kind of immigration certificate that's linked to a religious organization. But I think that's, that's in the minority during this time period. <clears throat> and of course, later in the mandate, you know, during certain decades, there are far less middle-class capitalists coming to Palestine because the British do allow um, more immigration certificates for workers who are not necessarily capitalists, but they're coming to, to take on work, not in kind of middle-class um, business or, or, or other kind, kind of industrial fields. Thank you. Um, Dan's asked a question. Okay. Um, he's asked, how did immigration regulations affect the, I mm. might butcher this name, I'm so sorry, um, Bedouin tribes that inhabited the Negev desert, um, desert? Did they travel between Palestine and Egypt or Saudi Arabia before the mandate? Oh, yeah, this is a good question. I think, I mean, a lot of what I work on that I didn't talk about here, obviously, is, um, is on border regulations and border controls. And there are certain exceptions that the British put in place and that the British and Transjordan also put in place for Bedouin or for semi-nomadic groups 
eventually, I think by the 1930s, I mean, of course, Bedouin don't have, for the most part, during the mandate, they don't have passports. They don't necessarily have the ability to go and to get visas and photographs if they're outside of Palestine to be able to just come in, you know, seasonally or with their animals. So the British do eventually make an exception that certain Bedouin tribes are exempt from immigration regulations. They can come in and go out as they please. Obviously in 1948, that ends quite abruptly. And even before that, it's kind of tapering off a bit when citizenship and having a passport and immigration control really become quite standardized. But there was definitely this element of travel between Palestine, between Egypt, I suppose, as well, um, Saudi or what later becomes Saudi Arabia, I think there are different regulations, but the British do process Bedouin coming in quite differently. And the British have kind of agreements specifically for Bedouin with other parts or other territories in the region to allow kind of ease of movement. Thank you. And you've also got two questions from Alex. Deva, the first question is, how does the Druze communities that stretch across southern Syria and into Palestine were perceived within this binary? If you want to answer that one first, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll answer that one first because that's a really interesting one. The Druze are another group that even if they're quite different from say the Armenians or um, Kurds maybe, um, they are treated in the same way by the British as if they're Druze from Syria or you know the Golan or something like that they're not given the automatic right to come into Palestine, even if Druze communities and, and towns and villages are divided between, say, Palestine and Lebanon and Syria. And certainly in the 1920s, you know, there are a number of episodes of Druze revolt against the French in Syria, in which the British are a lot less reluctant to allow the Druze to kind of stay in Palestine. Many Druze fled, not many, but there are Druze who fled from Syria in the 1920s and sought refuge in Palestine. And eventually the British do kick them out of Palestine because the British see them as they're not Palestinian Arabs, so they don't have the right to stay there. Um, and the British, of course, don't have a policy in their immigration legislation as to refugees specifically or displaced persons specifically. Um, in the earlier 1920s, Druze communities that are along the borders of what become the mandates, I think there are some that are divided by the borders themselves and those communities that are right on the borders so stretching across what becomes Palestine and Syria and Lebanon, they do have special border passes so they can come in and out, but they can't claim residence in the other territory that they live in, for instance. So they would be treated as simply as a regular immigrant, which is to say, usually not really authorized to, to come in and, and stay for any length of time in Palestine. The um, second part the second of that question one. is mm. that, did the border with French mandate territories affect how immigration in, in, in sorry, <laughs> indigenity was perceived in the light of European geopolitics in the region? Yeah, I think this is, yeah, this is a really good question as well. And I think the French, the French treat, them, treat migrants quite differently in Syria and Lebanon. They allow for different kinds of categories of citizenship and immigration and, and refugees and displaced persons. Whereas obviously, you know, Palestine, being Palestine, and I, you know, I think maybe Sarah mentioned this briefly, this kind of exceptionalism around understanding Palestine. To be sure, because of the way the mandate operated, the British, I mean, they felt they had to impose very specific restrictions on immigration that the French did not have to impose, and that the British and say, Jordan did not have to impose. And I think there were sort of tussles over individuals between the French and the British on this larger scale and um, in the region, especially at times of conflict and revolt. So the Druze rebellion, the Palestine re uh, rebellion in the 1930s as well affected the way that the French treated Palestinians coming into Syria as, you know, armed fighters um, organizing for revolt against the British and revolt against the Zionists in Palestine. And so 
I'm not really sure if if we can say that you know the ideals of who could immigrate and who was you know belonged to these particular territories really changed in light of how the British and the French um, treated individuals. But I think there is much more to be said that you know we don't have time to go into here that the British and the French at the same time period, the 1920s are really expanding immigration restrictions kind of empire wide. So it's not just the Middle East or the mandates that they're taking into account of having to have particular visas or passports or people having to show that they're a citizen of a particular territory. And of course the League of Nations and then later international bodies play a role in, in who um, can move around particular areas and who can be considered stateless or displaced. But I think that's probably um, material that I could go on and on about that we don't have time to. Um, thank you. I know Daisy's got a question for you as well. Daisy, if you'd like to unmute, please. Ah. Yeah, is my microphone working okay? Um, I just had a quick question. Um, do you believe that institutional racism or xenophobia in the British government impacted the extent to which Jewish people in Palestine were considered indigenous Jews. And I suppose that goes for the Palestinian Arabs as well. Hmm. That's a good question. I would probably ask if James would have a better answer than me. I, I don't, I think the British in, I think, you know, the British government and what's happening in say the metropole in the years leading up to the First World War, the way the British implemented immigration regulations that, you know, really in, in reality exempted a lot of Eastern European Jews from entering Great Britain, worked in a slightly separate way than what was happening in the mandate. And I think, to be sure, it's, it's not necessarily clear cut. I think, you know, some officials that are placed in the Palestine government or you know, on the opposite side in the colonial office or the Middle East office or later the, the foreign office in London, you know, some of them deeply believed that Eastern European or European Jews were essentially indigenous to Palestine going back, you know, centuries and centuries. And you know, the the religious kind of narrative or biblical narrative that was really in fashion in the late 19th century in sort of high British society and thinking about um relations with ottoman palestine and what to do with jews migrating there but i think how that translated into the way that british officials in palestine viewed jews is not necessarily as as straightforward or direct and i think that and again i probably one of the later talks today will go into this a lot more i'm assuming maybe jake jake norris's talk um the british were quite keen to see Jews in Palestine as European and as advanced and as able to bring capital and industry, not only to Palestine, but to the wider region, to Transjordan as well, um, in light of like electrification and things like that. So I, I think that indigeneity, the British saw Jews coming from Europe as having a right to enter Palestine, but they saw the Palestinian Arabs as quite different. Um, I'm not sure I'm really answering that as well as you probably want, but hopefully that kind of gives some some of an answer. Yeah, it definitely does. Thank you. Has anyone else got any questions? I think there um, is one more in the Yeah, James has put. How much is the reinvention of our identity in response to the colonial immigration system a universal feature of mandate life? Um, I, I'm assuming he means reinvention of identity on the part of either Jews or Arabs rather than on the part of what the British are doing. Um, I think actually this is this is maybe maybe I'm reinterpreting or I'm interpreting this wrong, but okay, I see James's response. Yes, I think for the most part you do have, if not a reinvention of identity, assertions of a particular maybe Ottoman identity of one being born in a particular place on the part of Arabs or even Armenians, um, others as a way 
to respond to colonial immigration policies in Palestine. I'm not sure about um, it being kind of a universal feature, but that would be interesting to think about further. I mean, for sure, you do have individuals who are trying to, to enter Palestine to reside or to work or to naturalize, who maybe aren't reinventing their identity, but are just emphasizing certain aspects of it that they think the British want. Um, and if it's not you know, being born in Ottoman Palestine and then moving out and then trying to claim that they have the right to go back, um, there's kind of emphasis on on the part of the Arabs, I think maybe more specifically, being industrious, being able to contribute to society as a means to legitimize their being allowed to enter on the same scale that um, Jewish immigrants are. And so there's kind of a lot of, of um, comparisons drawn in certain petitions against deportation, for instance, or in you know naturalization petitions by Arabs. Um, comparing themselves to Jewish migrants and saying, well, why is there a difference here or a distinction and who can enter more easily than others? Um, again, I'm not sure if that kind of answers it. As for the, you know, the Jewish Zionist side, I don't think there was, you know, much of a need for kind of reinvention in response to immigration regulations. I think for sure there are ways that Jewish migrants do try and get around regulations if they don't get an immigration certificate. You know, things like false marriages, um, claiming to have a certain amount of capital that they don't actually have to enter. Um, but I think it would be interesting to, to kind of think further about this though. Thank you, Vivian. Petro's also asked, um, uh, sorry, I missed the first part of the talk. Wanted to ask if during the mandate the British used any humanitarian um, justifications and practices, practices to facilitate Jewish immigration. Thank you. Hmm. I mean, there were none, that's a good question. I don't think there were any specifically worded into Palestine's immigration legislation because I think I said this earlier, Palestine is one of these territories in the interwar period that and obviously once the Second World War starts, that there is no specific clause in immigration law that say refugees from anywhere, whether Jewish or otherwise, have the right to enter or claim asylum, even though the British allowed for that in different ways, say in Great Britain or in some other territories. I think the League of Nations, Nansen passports at this point, so passports for stateless people, um, were the realm of international organizations and humanitarian organizations, but even the British were a bit reluctant to allow anyone who was classified as stateless because of conflict or war to come into Palestine. So even specific, the specific passports to say Armenians um, or Russian, uh, Russian refugees after the civil war in Russia, the British didn't really want those groups coming into Palestine and they also didn't want groups that could be politically problematic. I mean, and of course that's not new to colonial legislation to try and outlaw um, political agitators or you know, potentially threatening or subversive political adversaries. And so the British really, I, I didn't think in Palestine at least they were as keen on humanitarian arguments for anything. And then obviously, as many of you probably know, in 1939, the British really kind of quashed Jewish refugee immigration or displaced immigration to Palestine because of um, <clears throat> sort of wider political policy during the outbreak of the Second World War. And you know, Jews entering on humanitarian right were or there was no humanitarian right. Of course, you know, boats were sent right back, or refugees who made it into Palestine were deported or detained elsewhere. Um, and the British, had the mandate continued, probably would have. Um, um, maintain that kind of deportation detention policy. Um, thank you everybody for the questions and thank you Dr. Banker for such a brilliant paper.